Let us pray together. Let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Who here has spent much time studying the book of Revelation? And thank you for saying Revelation. There is only one Revelation in the Bible. It's not Revelations. Who has spent much time studying the book of Revelation? None of us. Myra, you don't count. You do count. I'm just teasing. Um, yeah, we, so Luther thought that there should be two books removed from the Bible because they are worthless. One was James and the other was Revelation. Revelation is a tough book and it's not a book we Lutherans usually dive into very much. Those who have been here around House of Prayer for a long time, how many times have you heard your pastors do Bible studies on Revelation? How many times have you heard your pastors preaching on Revelation? Any? Maybe I should just sit down right now. I'm going into uncharted territory. <laughs> well, to be honest, um, I've not really been, a, no one really talked about Revelation much to me when I was in your shoes growing up in the church and in church. Um, I'd never, no one really taught much about Revelation. I didn't know what to make of it. We've heard a little bit about it. It pops up in our liturgy actually all the time. Um, we just sang parts of Revelation already. Um, the second verse of the, of the canticle of praise we sang, worthy is the lamb who is slain, um, that from Revelation. In a little bit, we'll sing the holy, holy, holy Lord. Revelation. Lamb of God, you take away the sin. Revelation again. Um, yeah, so Revelation has a really strong place in our liturgy, but yet none of us really know much about the book. So my first exposure to anyone talking about Revelation was in college. Um, and the cool thing about like public colleges like Pitt where I went to school is they don't give you like the Christian perspective on things. This was the Bible and early Christianity taught by someone who I don't think was actually a Christian. And she, she was going to teach Revelation. And she said something that I've never forgotten and never been able to like push away or just not, for, not think of. She said, think about this guy that wrote Revelation. All we know about him is his name is John. And not John the gospel writer or John that writes John 1, 2, 3, but rather some guy named John of Patmos is how he's kind of remembered historically. And what else we know about him is that he was in a prison in the island of Patmos as he wrote this book. And she said, let me tell you about prisons in the second century, 110, 120 AD. She said he was probably in a place with no windows, no light, maybe not water and food as would have been for a healthy person. And he would have been there for a lengthy period of time. Has anyone undergone long periods of time without light? Good. Neither have I. But apparently, it really messes you up. People in those sorts of situations are prone to hallucinations and other kinds of crazy dreams and ideas about the world. And it's from that place that John of Patmos writes Revelation. Now, I think her intent was actually to say, see, it's just a hallucination, Revelation. Now, I'm not going to go there, but there is something beautiful and something powerful about the book of Revelation. For those of us who know a little bit about it, we know that it's not a real clear, easy story to follow. It's written in this style called apocalypsis, which doesn't mean the end of days. That's what it means now. 2,000 years ago, apocalypsis was a style of writing that was used regularly. It was meant to reveal something. Apocalypsis means revealing. Um, not end of days, revealing. And so this guy, John of Patmos, writes this story to reveal how God loves the world. At least that's my take on it. It's written with all this darkness, all this symbology, all these crazy animals and demons and monsters and da dragons. And it's, it's bigger than The Hobbit and bigger than Lord of the Rings and bigger than the biggest sci-fi story you can think of. But at the end, there is one singular point. God wins. God's love prevails. And John does something really interesting as he writes this book. I could go into a million sermons about this. We probably need like days and days of sermons to talk about Revelation and to dig into it with any sort of authenticity and integrity. But he does this thing that I want to invite you to think about. He continues to appeal to senses, to your hearing, to what you see. And often he juxtaposes those two things. I heard this, and then I saw this. 
So the, the reading from Revelation today, and then the gospel also, speaks about the lamb. Jesus being the lamb who was slain, as we'll sing in a little bit. The shepherd, that kind of imagery. Here's how the lamb gets introduced in chapter 5, a couple chapters before where we are. Um, John writing, I saw that there was a scroll in the right hand of the one sitting on the throne. The scroll was written on the inside and on the outside, and it was sealed with seven seals. I saw a strong angel announcing in a loud voice, does anybody deserve to open the scroll to undo its seals? Nobody in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look at it. I burst into tears because it seemed that there was nobody who was worthy to open the scroll or even to look inside. One of the elders, however, spoke to me. Don't cry, he said. Look, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has won the victory. He can open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I looked, and I saw in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, a lamb. There's this invitation I mean, this is at the heart of Revelation over and over again, but at this moment where the, the lamb is introduced, where Jesus is introduced, it's not a lamb. As he hears, he hears of a lion. A lion is at the center of this thing. A lion will free. But then when he sees, it's the lamb. Have you had experiences in your life where you heard one thing, and then when you finally were able to feast your eyes on it, it was completely different? The most obvious one I can think of is listening to people on the radio. So you listen to the, like a radio person, personality for a long, long time. And then you finally see them and you're like, no way, he looks like that? That's crazy. Have you had experiences like that? I think in the world we live in, especially now, we tend to not be very sensory people. We are screen people. Revelation invites us into the fullness of our senses. That's why we draw revelation into our worship so often. Worship is sensory. We sit, we stand. At the evening worship, we use incense to use our noses. If we're sitting beside each other, we get to use our noses to smell each other. We hear each other with our voices singing our prayers together. We see each other. We see pageantry. We see these, well, I see the beautiful stained glass windows. You see vestments that we all wear. You see the beautiful symbols, the ribbons of this Easter season. Everything about worship is to draw us into our senses. Friends, what do you sense beyond these walls when you're not in worship? How is God calling you out of your humdrum day, out of the the world of screens, to use your senses? What do you hear? What do you see? How do you hear God? How do you see God in your everyday life? That's not rhetorical. I invite you now to divide up into small groups of three and share your answers with each other. And make sure everyone talks. Don't get into a group of two or three or four and let someone not talk. Let's get into those groups now and talk for a few minutes about how you see God in your eyes and how you hear God in your daily life. I'll give you an easy one right off the bat. I like to bike ride, as you know. The first bike ride I went on four years ago, I was amazed at what I smelled going on the same roads that I'd driven on lots of times. Going down 51 on the berm of the road there and smelling along that way was amazing. Get into groups of two or three and talk. Share your stories with each other. You two in the choir also, yes. Get to sharing. Or now you can just continue talking. (laughs) Just teasing. Wake up someone too if they're sleeping. Let us come back together. No. I hope that's a no because, like, the conversation is so rich and so good. See, something that's beautiful is um, God did not give me the corner on the gospel around here. And the fact of the matter is we all have the gospel. We can all point to the things God is doing in our daily lives. Um, We had to be a little more, uh, like, pointing to that for Chris here. He was not willing to share too much. We had to wrestle it out of him. And so it is with some of us. Some of us, you really need to wrestle the God out of us because we just can't see it, can't hear it, can't smell it. Continue 
friends, brothers and sisters, to wrestle the God out of your life and out of each other's life. Be together in this journey and continue using all of your senses to experience God all the time. God is not only in here on Sunday mornings. God's actually out there when you leave, too. I know. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, make us aware of our senses. Make us aware of you just totally enveloping this world. Help us to experience you in our seeing, in our hearing, in our smelling, in our tasting, and in the ways we experience and touch and feel this world around us. You are everywhere in it. Help us to experience you always.